Hi, this video is sponsored by Autodesk. Today we're going to look at uh, creating NPM fluids and we're going to look at some new features in Bifrost as well. So let's just create a graph and I'm just going to drag in uh, a sphere that's up the top here. That's going to be our emitter. And I'm also going to drag in this sphere which is going to be a collider. And I'm just going to start typing uh, sand because I know that we've got some basic sand graphs set up already. They don't have a fluids one set up already. I think it's because it's still an experimental node. So let's hit explode there. And uh, let's just move these guys out of the way. And instead of using sand, I'm just going to delete that and type in fluid. And we're going to get a fluid going. So we're just going to drag the fluid into sources. And because it's an NPM simulation, obviously we can have sand, snow, uh, fluid, and um, other things like fiber strands and shell and cloth so everything just fits in nicely so there's our top sphere i'm going to plug that into the fluid there and there is our bottom sphere um and i'm going to plug that into the collider now so the fluid is going to come down it's going to hit that sphere creating a collision but on the floor here i should create another collider uh, to capture some of that liquid however there's a new feature our first new feature in this video uh in bifrost 2.6 um, which is a ground influence. So if I just start typing ground and uh, we can get in a ground plane influence. Now I believe the ground plane influence uh, uses fields um, and doesn't work in the same way as like a, a voxelized collider. The ground plane influence is super fast. Like it's, uh, if you're not colliding with anything else um, and you just want to use a ground plane, don't use a collider, um, just use this ground plane influence because it's, it's much, much faster uh, to interact with. And it's kind of cool, so we can see it in the scene if we hit on the diagnostics button here, uh, it's going to show up in the scene here. And it's infinite, So, but we can change some parameters, some visual parameters if we want to by using the diagnostic scale, if we just put in like 15 here. We can see that it grows out and we can move it around and change its bounciness. I'm just going to set that to zero because I don't want my fluid bouncing around the place. And we could um, add in other influences to it, which is quite interesting. Um, so we've got the fluid. The first thing I like to do with the fluid to speed up simulations uh, is to take it from the default of 50 for the vibration speed down to something like 15. That's going to speed things up. I haven't seen much difference between 50 and 15. Um, but, you know, I'm not saying there isn't. So, with the NPM selected, uh, I'm just going to I'm gonna plug this into the output and we'll just see what we've got going on. So, I'll just rewind and play. And we can see that we've just got like one, uh, one kind of like grouping of uh, particles coming out. That's because we've not got our emission on constantly. We've got it set to end frame. So, I'm just going to switch that off. Um, actually, I might switch it on, but I might just change the frame to like something like 55. Um, in particles per voxel, I'm just going to put this up to something like 12. That's just going to give us a few more particles to play with. Um, and if I rewind and play now, you can see that we've got very, very fast uh, simulation happening. But, you know, like, <laughs> it doesn't look great, um, but we'll get there in a bit. So, always best to simulate a uh, lower res at first. So, we can see that it's connecting and colliding with that ground plane already, which is awesome. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the resolution up and we get to that via detail size within the uh, NPM parameters here. And I'm going to take that down to 10. That's just going to give us, like, a denser amount of particles to look at. Um... But still, like, nowhere near what we're going to need. So let's just play that through. Okay, so we can see that we've got, you know, this hard spread of what is going to be a liquid once we've meshed it, um, hitting that surface. So the first thing I want to show is um, what we can do with this surface. There's a new feature, again, in Bifrost 2.6. If we go into the collider itself, uh, there's a couple of things I want to show here. But the first thing, let's just get rid of bounciness, is this new stickiness value, um, which is awesome. Um, I've wanted this for a while, and for the longest while, I've been using friction, well, for my YouTube videos. Because I'm on the beta team, I've known that stickiness has been about for a while, but uh, I've not been allowed to talk about it. 
So it's always cool when a new version comes out and I can finally sort of show things off. So if we stick in five on stickiness and I rewind and play, we're going to be able to see something different. Now all of that water isn't flying off everywhere. And in fact, it's starting to look quite gloopy and give us those kind of viscosity type um, uh, properties. Um, we haven't got any viscosity on this at the moment, but the stickiness has given us that look. So that's like really cool. Um, the second thing I want to show while we're playing around with stickiness uh, is just more diagnostics. So if we go into the collider and we hit this uh, display diagnostic, um, and then we hit the diagnostic button on the simulate NPM node, we're going to be able to see that uh, we're going to be able to see that collider kind of creating itself. So we're just going to start playing, and if you can see there, if you can see that, but I'll just no, I can't select it. But we can see that the, there is a collision object. Actually, if I just hide that, the collision object is growing as our NPM particles get closer to it. Now this is good if you're trying to troubleshoot things like thin surfaces or, or, or places where you've got issues with collision. But you can see that that is growing over time and only where like it's needed. We can also see we've got diagnostics happening on the NPM itself. So I'm just going to switch that off for now because we don't need to see it. Um, and I'll just uh, display show, show last hidden to get our uh, sphere back again. So I think at this point we could uh, we could add a little bit more detail to our NPM. So let's just go back to the detail size. I'm going to put it like 0 0.06 and rewind. <clears throat> actually, I've actually just put that in in the wrong place. Uh, so let's just go back a couple of seconds. I need to go to the detail size. I'm always doing that. So 0 0.06, uh, rewind and play. And we should see that it's like still fairly fast. Um, it's still totally directable and, and usable. So we've got that one going. And now let's just go with creating a second fluid source. So I'm just going to duplicate this. Control C and Control V. And move that up. And I'm going to plug that into our sources down here. So now we've got two sources happening. And we'll bring in our other source. Um, emitter, which is our sphere, and we can make some changes to this one. Let's just get rid of this. So this one, maybe we want it to start and finish at the same end frame, um, but instead of that, maybe we want it. We actually want it to be a bit more gloopy. So with viscosity, um, I think that's set at like 0.0001. If I just go like 0.1, that's going to be quite a high setting for viscosity. Things will slow down a little bit now because we've got two sources, two amounts of um, um, emission going on. So we can see there's like a, a huge difference between the, the two of these. One's a lot more kind of viscose and the other one's just kind of like flying around all over the place. But they're mixing together and we're starting to create some like really cool interest. Um, we're going to get some gloopy stuff and we're going to get some wet stuff. And, um, you know, this is, uh, this is, this is really cool stuff. So right about now, I'm just going to leave the simulation where it is. Just let it sit there. And I'm going to look at meshing this. Um, in the real world practice uh, I would expect to up this resolution um, a bit more so that we do, so that we've just got like more detail to play with but just for this tutorial I'm gonna leave it there I would just say to you that if when you want to start meshing your stuff and you want it to look super realistic is to go back into the NPM solver and bring that detail size down enough so that you've got some really decent detail but you're not also, you're not also killing your machine and it is going to be like machine specific so from here i'm going to uh create a points to volume and let's just go down to points to volume and then i'm going to create a volume to mesh 
Um, but let's just deal with points to volume first. Let's just get points to volume into here and just out, output points to volume. And we can then click on store level set and we see that it shows up in the graph. It doesn't look too bad. Again, like I said, for this tutorial, I'm not going to go mental with this uh, in terms of resolution. Um, but we can play with uh, certain aspects. Resolution mode is set to absolute by default, but we could obviously change this, bring this down a lot lower. Like if I bring this down to like 0.01, we can see that we're starting to see um, you know, the actual particles themselves, which is why you're probably going to want to up your actual resolution on the solver itself. Because you're gonna, you want to start to get like thinner, uh, thinner looking um, mesh. So I'm going to leave points to volume at 0.02, I believe, and then I'm just going to bring in a uh, volume to mesh and just link these guys together into a new output. And we can see that our mesh has turned up. And it doesn't look too bad. If you want your mesh to look like more amazing, we're going to need some more detail in the actual particles themselves. Um, but there are some small adjustments we can do on the volume to mesh itself. We can use this level set threshold. And if I just start cranking this to the right, you're going to see um, everything kind of grow. So it's growing, but it's also averaging out that detail around. And it can get rid of some bumpiness. Um, and we'll use this plus... Um, the detail size by dragging that down a little bit we'll start to get some changes going on in the mesh itself like that's just going to start um, making the resolution a lot more dense like if I have that one we can see that the resolution um, is a lot lower so you know it's going to be down to your personal taste what your machine can handle the distance as well that you are from you know your fluid that's going on but um, you're probably going to want a lot more detail than this if I rewind and play now, it's a meshed simulation, but I mean, that's not too slow, um, especially when you think about what's going on here. We've got like a collision of two different viscose surfaces. They're sticking to a surface. So that brings me on to another super cool thing. Um, let's say that you've created something that just looks beautiful and you just want to use it for like still renders or, or whatever. Um, you don't actually have to cache this out. What you could do, um, if you just wanted a still of this, is use a new feature in Bifrost 2.6, which I love. Um, and that is, on your output, if you're using a mesh or any other mesh within Bifrost, it doesn't have to be an NPM uh, simulation, you can now right-click on the output and go to Create Maya Mesh. And if we go to um, the outliner, we can see that there is a mesh there now. And if we move that away and pause the graph, we can see that that mesh now sits on its own within Maya. We don't have to go through the whole rigmarole like we did before um, in the node editor and all of that kind of thing. Um, important uh, is to, I, I delete by type history and I'll modify freeze transformations. In the past, I've tried to use this and delete like certain faces, but until I got rid of that history and it seems froze the transformations, I couldn't delete the faces. Deleting one face would delete the entire mesh, but now we could go ahead and uh, do anything we want to it, delete faces, everything works. So that's really cool. So if we wanted to, if we created something that looked really nice, um, you know, we could just like shade this now it's just easy to just assign a new material um, just stick an Arnold surface shader on it like so and then just put a preset of glass or water on it something like that and we could just start to render it um, we just go on a render view and hit render um, and you could so you could create splashes little droplets um, that kind of thing you do build yourself up a library um, and um, you know all of these um, my meshes but it's not working it's not animated you could you know if you want to animate it you're gonna to need to cache it um, but you know it does look very cool very cool indeed and it's a great new feature right so let's get rid of that I'm gonna delete this mesh and I'm gonna come back to our animation what we're doing here 
So in example, at the beginning of the video, we can see there are different colors happening um, on this. And I'm just gonna go through how to do that now. It's not a perfect science at the moment. Um, some work needs to be done to this and with this. Um, and as I said, if there are these little icons showing up, that means that this is still an experimental node and very much still in beta or beta or however the hell you want to say it. Right, so we've got a mesh happening and um, what we want to do is we want to be able to uh, create uh, two different colors. I want color on this and I want color on this. So within the source fluid uh, itself, we can right click on additional properties and create a source color property. Okay, and that's gone down there. But if we look at that source color property, we can see that its property is color by default and it's got a base color to it. So we could click on that base color and we could choose ourselves some kind of horrible color. But we can also add in other things here um, uh, to, to drive the color if we wanted to. Um, but I'm going to go and do the same thing on this property as well. So I'm going to go create node and color property. And this one I might just sort of make, uh, you know, again, some kind of horrible color. But it's brighter. So there's some more steps to do. But um, while we're here, we could just clean up a couple of things. Um, so I could just, you know, stick a backdrop around this. <clears throat> and now we can see in backdrops, um, we've got some differences themselves. Again, a new feature. If I was to click on this button here, we can change colors. So if we want to make this red, we can. We can change the title size by default. It's, uh, uh, well, what is default? I guess it's zero if this is just one and two. But whatever, we can make that bigger and we can uh, type in here um, and just sort of you know, tell ourselves or someone else that this is source one. So another cool thing that we can do um, within this is to um, create stickies. So if I just hit the tab key, um, sorry, if I just right click and I go create sticky note, I can now put in some information um, about about this uh, source. I could just sort of say, uh, um, note the color node. And we can change the sticky color and, and change text sizes and all of that kind of thing. And this is nice. We can start to make little notes of stickies and backdrops uh, a lot more easier now. Um, and they're a bit more pleasing on the eye. And obviously we can read them a lot better. Before we used to have to zoom right in and read things. But now we've got, you know, this kind of system where we can, you know, write endless notes. Which is nice. So. We've got our color coming out here, and that information is feeding down the chain. Um, if I stick a watch point on here, it might show it, it might not. No, it's going to show up a size, but I'll, I'll get that in a minute when I get um, the next point going. We need to get that information from here. We need to get the information from here, which is feeding down here and coming out post-sim to the other side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down the first in array. That's going to help us get the information that we want. If I now type in, I want to get geo property, so get underscore geo property, and a get geo property allows us to grab things from anywhere, from the information anywhere, any you know on on any node. Um, so the information we want is um, point color, point underscore color, and we're going to take that information from the array. So let's just unplug this for a second. Now I know this is uh, math float free, so we're just going to go into uh, array array math float free. And there are a couple of ways of doing this, but for me, I'm just going to go a set geo property, and I'm just going to put the data into the data, and I'm going to take uh, the first in array into the geometry. So now we've got the color coming out of here. If I plug that in, um, I should be able to get the list 
showing up. There we go. And we can see the point color is in there. Obviously, with a get um, a get geo property, we can get any of these um, things and you know do other interesting things at the back end of it. So let's just remove that. So we've got the point color. We've set the point color. So out here, we've got point color. What do we do with it? How do we actually give that mesh um, a point color? So the first we're going to need to do here is just stick in um, uh, an assigned material. And then we need to just jump into Arnold quickly and uh, create a shader. Right, so let's not make the use the one I made earlier. <laughs> That'd be too easy. So let's just hit the tab and start taking, typing AI standard surface. So we get a, an Arnold surface shader turn up here. Now we need to tell the color of this shader to use point color. Okay, so we need to, to do that. We need to put in an AI user data color like so. And within here, this attribute, we're gonna type in point underscore color. So with the color selected, we'll drag that out into the base color of the shader. And then we're going to drag that shader into here. So it's going to grab its color, hopefully, from the two nodes that are um, further up the chain, which are the source color properties. So it's going to pull out this color and it's going to pull out this color. So let's just plug that into there. Now, it's not something we're going to see on the mesh as yet. Um, potentially in future releases, who knows, we might be able to see colours. So, if I just start letting that play for a second, <clears throat> we can see that they're kind of merging together and doing their thing. And then if I stop that there and I just go to Arnold, Arnold Render View and hit play here. Yes, we can see there are two colours. Those two colors are merging. Every now and then you're going to get some like spot, spotting and stuff like that. Um, there are ways around this. This isn't a perfect science, but this is uh, a way to get colors uh, merging together. There will be some artifacts show up, but there are some ways to kind of smooth those out. Um, but this is cool because now you can mix colors together with different types of liquids. Viscose liquid. So if you want to start doing like chocolate and put cream on top of it or whatever for your um, pack shots you can do that um, and it's uh, it's actually really fast so um, yeah so it's, uh, that's that's about it really I think I've gone through all of the um, or some of the new features that I wanted to talk about if we do want to smooth out those um, the the interaction between the two fluids uh, we could if we just hit the tab and start to type smooth um, we could go to a, a smooth voxel property and in the uh, property I'll just type in voxel underscore color and in between the volume to mesh and the points to volume I could just plug in this uh, smooth property um, uh, I believe we've lost our sim because of this, but I mean that is just how things go. Uh, let's just rewind and play. Let those two interact for a second. And this would just allow us to smooth the two voxels from the opposing fluids together. Um, and so let's just kind of stop there and let's start rendering. See if we can get in a little bit closer to see this. We, so we can see that the two are kind of like smooth together. Um, but I think if we use the filter width. We should start to see some smoothing happening. There we go. So if we do the standard deviation, we can see that we're starting to get a gradient between the two. Now, depending on what you're doing, you may or may not want to do this. Um, personally, for the look that I'm going for, um, I didn't want to. But you could like bring it back between the two and just go for two. It really depends on what you're trying to do. But, you know, just showing you that it's there. Again, thanks to uh, Phil Mayer for helping me out with um, a couple of these things. I had overcomplicated some of this. Um, and I didn't actually know about the uh, smooth voxel property. 
Um, but yeah, I had way overcomplicated getting the colours out of the two. Uh, but we kind of like both got there together in a way. Um, and yeah, actually found that it is doable. Um, so it's not perfect, but this is a cool way to mix fluids together, get some gunk going, um, get those pack shots, you know, making some um, cool looking stuff. Again, you know, we can start right clicking things and creating my meshes out of, you know, pretty much anything within Bifrost. So um, loving it. All right, guys, take care. I'll try and fit in another one before the holidays. Um, uh, uh, yeah, no, I will try and fit one in before holidays. Cheers, guys. Take it easy. Bye-bye.